Good evening. Four years ago, this week, in fact, Crime Watch UK came to our TV screens for the first time. Since then, thanks to Crime Watch viewers, over 150 suspects have been arrested. Of those cases which have so far gone to trial, six murderers and ten armed robbers have been sent to prison. So when people ask, does Crime Watch really work, the answer is certainly, it does. In fact, so far, around 30,000 viewers have called into the programme, and we hope that you will tonight. Here's the number, and here are the detectives from all around the United Kingdom waiting for your call. And for viewers who are deaf or hard of hearing, these subtitles will be available to you throughout the programme on page 888 of CFAX. Well, this month, police in Northern Ireland need your help with a murder investigation. A young German student who'd travelled around Britain before crossing by ferry to Ireland from Stranra to Larne. Also in Stoke, armed robbers who were caught in the act but escaped and apparently struck again an hour later. And in Hertfordshire, the murder of 81-year-old Joan McCann, a war heroine who'd become a respected breeder of Labradors. And in Photocall, a bogus video salesman who was videoed himself. Six weeks ago, the body of a young woman was found by a farmer in County Antrim. She was Inga Hauser, an 18-year-old student who travelled to Britain from Munich using an interrail pass. That's a ticket to travel on virtually any train in Europe. Judging from the diary that was found among her belongings, she thoroughly enjoyed herself. But somehow, things went wrong. Can you help tell us how and where? Our reconstruction begins just after she'd arrived in London at Easter time. Saturday, 2nd of April. Dear Mum and Dad, you dears, you probably could not imagine how much I like England. I would preferably stay a year longer. I am totally entranced by London. And you don't need to worry about me, for the people here are so lovable and so ready to help that I'm quite sure I shall never be short of money. See you soon. Happy Easter. Your Inge Maria. During her trip, Inga kept notes in her diaries and she wrote several postcards to friends and relatives. Oxford is Train at platform two is the 1346 to Banbury, Leamington Spa, Coventry. Monday, 4th of April. Went to Oxford. Stayed at the youth hostel. Ate too much. Decided to go to Bath. Inga phoned home regularly. She also took snapshots of the places she visited. Tuesday, 5th of April. Going to Liverpool now. Took a short walk through Liverpool Station region. Went on to Preston and from there to Inverness. Slept in the train. Dear Gabi, dear Christian, dear Martina, morning has broken in Scotland. Breakfast in Inverness. Nice town. Have to see the Loch Ness monster one day. There are no more postcards after this, and this is her last photograph. But her diaries go on. My journey has run without hitch so far and it is really indescribably lovely. Unfortunately, my money is slowly running out. Inga drew this sketch of someone on a train. Do you know who it is? Going to Glasgow now. Snowy mountains, wild landscape. Went from Glasgow to Ayr and from there to Stranra to get over to Ireland. Saw the sea, beautiful and mysterious. Wonder where I stay tonight. Need more money. That was the last entry in her diary. These two passengers were boarding the ferry when they almost bumped into Inga. They remember following her onto the boat. Later, one of them saw Inga cross the lounge but she was without her rucksack. Where was it? 
had she left it with someone else. A few minutes afterwards, Inga was seen on deck. Again, she didn't have her rucksack. This was the last positive sighting that police have of Inga. The ferry, the Galloway Princess, docked at Larn shortly after 9.30 that evening. But the witnesses say Inga was not among the foot passengers who caught the train to Belfast. Were you on that train? If so, did you see Inga? More than 100 vehicles were on the ferry that night. So did someone give Inga a lift? And if so, who? And where did they go? Inga could have travelled anywhere in Ireland. For two weeks, she disappeared. But up the coast from Larne, near Bally Castle, a woman like Inga was seen. Several people have told police that a girl was hitchhiking in the North Antrim area on Sunday the 17th of April. If it wasn't Inga, do you know who it was? At the northeast tip of County Antrim is Ballypatrick Forest. And here, in a remote corner over a mile from the main road, a farmer was searching for his sheep. He'd spotted something in a small clearing and went back to have a look. Inga had been dead for several days. She had severe head injuries, but no motive has been established for her murder. On the Sunday, three days before Inga's body was found, two local people noticed a red car pull out behind them. It was travelling away from the point where Inga was later found. A man and a woman were in the car. The vehicle went down a no-through road. Who was in the car and what were they doing in the forest? Above all, where had Inga been for the fortnight since she left the ferry on the 6th of April? till her body was discovered among the trees. Mr Kasky, we're talking about events that happened after Easter and the two weeks immediately after that. That's a long time ago. Now, if anybody had seen Inga, why would they remember her? Uh, she was a friendly and outgoing young girl and uh, made friends easily. Uh, she liked England and uh, the English people and took delight in telling people about this. If anyone uh, met her in her travels throughout England and Scotland, and she struck up conversation about this, uh, we would be very pleased to hear from them, particularly if she imparted to them uh, her plans uh, when she was going to Ireland. Now, the key does seem to be what happened at Larne, because that's where her letters home stop, that's when her phone calls stop, that's when the diary stops. A missing, a blank two weeks. So people on that boat presumably must hold the key to it. Yes, I, I would make an appeal to the people on the boat. Uh, anyone who made the crossing that night, who saw Inga, was she in anyone's company? Uh, did they see her leave the boat and again, was she in anyone's company? Uh, or was she seen leaving Larne? And if so, by what means? The motive. I know you don't know what it is, but you must have quite strong suspicions. What are they? I believe the motive uh, to be sexual, but I do believe that Inga did fight for her honour and uh, she died as a result of putting up a fight. Well, there must be people watching who have some idea of where Inga was, what she was doing, or think they saw her, or who might have suspicions about who committed this crime. Do please call if you can help in any way. 01811 That's 01811 It's in the strictest confidence. And if you don't want to speak to a police officer, you can ask to talk to a BBC researcher, if you prefer. You can also phone the murder incident room at Bally Castle. That's on 02657 637 That's 02657, the code for Bally Castle, 637 well, there have been seven arrests as a result of last month's programme. Two of those were on the following morning. We showed you a photograph of suspects wanted in connection with £6,000 worth of bounced cheques. Two men have now been charged with theft and deception.
And there's news about the jewel theft from Bowwood House in Wiltshire. On Friday the 29th of April, jewellery worth £150,000 was stolen by people who were posing as tourists. As a result of information from calls to the studio, police mounted an operation and two days ago, four men and one woman were arrested in raids in three separate towns across the south of England. And you might remember we appealed for help with a murder in London's Docklands. Police scientists have conducted extensive tests to try and build up a description of the victim. Two callers rang with the same name. One of the calls came from Holland. But the person they suggested was not the victim, in fact. But as a result of another call, police have asked us to help them trace a woman called Patricia Bowman. Originally from Goole in Humberside, she's also known to have lived in Lincolnshire and in London and may have a daughter aged 19 or 20. So please do ring us if you can help. But there was a disappointing response to last month's appeal for help about an assault on a police officer in Dufford. Early one Saturday morning, two men broke into the football club at Haverford West to steal from fruit machines. Although they tried to sabotage the alarm system, they failed and the police were alerted. One of the officers was violently attacked. Despite a good number of calls, police say their investigation is frankly no further forward. And well, now to Incident Desk, where the police appeal to you directly. Tonight, an assault on a family near Reading. A workman in Dorset killed by a hit and run driver and some Royal Worcester vases which have turned up in Yorkshire. Perhaps they belong to you. Here's Superintendent David Hatcher. Tonight, we need to speak to three unusual looking men about a vicious attack and robbery of a family who run this pub, The Crown, in Lower Basildon, near Reading. We want to know if you were there earlier in the evening of the attack, last bank holiday Monday. Now, that was the weekend of the telethon. Or you might recognise the following artist's impressions of the men we want to trace. The first man has blonde hair and was wearing a turquoise T-shirt. That nasty triangular-shaped scar would be difficult to hide. This one is about 28, 5 foot 8 inches tall and stocky. He's also got a facial scar running up his cheekbone. The third man is probably in his 30s and 5 foot 10 to 6 feet tall. He's got a drooping jaw and a missing front tooth. He's also said to have a protruding bone at the back of his left shoulder. Have a look at all of them together. Now £10,000 worth of cash and jewellery were stolen from the family, including £1,000 raised for the telethon. Someone must know these men. If you do, call us. There is a substantial reward. These small fragments of plastic have helped us identify a type of car involved in a fatal hit-and-run accident in Dorset. Now we need your help to find the actual car and the driver. On Friday the 13th of May, Owen Clark was laying cat size on the newly surfaced A356 between Dorchester and Crewe Kern. About 1.30pm that afternoon, he was hit by a car and died of his injuries before the ambulance arrived. The pieces of indicator lens have identified the car as a 1977 to 1980 Datsun Violet. This is a paint sample, the same colour as paint chips found at the scene. It's metallic bluey green. The car would have sustained serious damage to the front end and forensic investigation has revealed that it had previously been repaired with filler. A witness in a nearby village remembers seeing a similar car that afternoon being driven by a man of about 20 with a pointed chin. Because that road's often used as an approach to the M5, we think that car could be anywhere now. So, have you seen a Datsun like this with recent damage to its front? Or have you ever owned one this colour which was repaired and resprayed? Next, do you know who these belong to? They're hand-painted fine porcelain vases made in the 1950s by Royal Worcester. Each is signed by the artist and the whole collection is worth some £16,000. We believe they could have been stolen from a private home anywhere in the country. So have a closer look. This dis design is described by Royal Worcester as ripening fruit on a mossy woodland bank. If they're yours or you know who they belong to, ring us now. If you've seen anyone peddling one of these recently, you could help solve a burglary. 55 of these Schwinn exercise cycles were taken from premises in Derby on May Day weekend. They're quite rare. Only 100 of them are in legitimate circulation. They're particularly distinctive because of this large front wheel encased in a protective metal cage. Only two shops in the UK stock this type. One is in Wigmore Street, London, 
and the other at the Metro Centre Gateshead. So watch out. If you're offered one, you may be being taken for a ride. Here's the number, 01811 That's 01811 Our next reconstruction is of break-ins at two homes in the Midlands. They were just 15 miles apart and they happened within hours of each other. The first one was at the house of a coal merchant in Burton-on-Trent. The other at a family farm at Blythe Bridge, just outside Stoke-on-Trent. Police are not certain that the same gang were responsible, but the two cases do have strong similarities, and on both occasions the intruders were interrupted. Our report begins on Friday, May the 13th, at Blythe Bridge, on the outskirts of Stoke. The village of Blythe Bridge is noted for the Foxfield Light Railway, with its lovingly restored steam engines and rolling stock. Immediately next to the railway is a 20-acre small holding called Heath House Farm. It's owned by Gordon Plant, who breaks and trains pedigree horses. He's helped by his son Rod, an expert horseman and show jumper. For both father and son, Friday, May the 13th, started normally. At about half past seven, Rod checked his horses and then left for Stoke Market, where he runs a stall selling cheese. Soon after that, Gordon locked up the house, leaving his Jack Russell puppy, Rambo, and Alsatian Fritz in charge. Rod. <coughs> He then set off to join Rod at the cheese stall, confident that the farm was being well looked after. About an hour later, and 15 miles away in Burton-on-Trent, coal merchant Stanley Inslee was also following his normal morning routine and setting off to start his rounds. This would have been around nine o'clock. Later that day, probably around half past two, someone was outside the house at the French windows. A garage window was forced as well. Stan Inslee's Datsun Bluebird was reversed out to the house. It seems the plan was to drive off with the safe in Stan Inslee's own car, but at three o'clock he returned. They didn't get the safe, but they did get more than a thousand pounds worth of gold jewellery. A neighbour remembers seeing three men walking fast down the road. At least one of them was wearing a suit. Within the hour, back at Blythe Bridge, a local resident driving near Heath House Farm had to swerve to avoid a man in a dark suit. At about half past four, Rod Plant was on his way home with his young cousin, Simon, who was coming to help with the stock. Once again, the target seemed to be the safe. As they approached the yard, Rod and Simon noticed a horse had got loose. Your old man. He's out. When will he be back? Six, seven o'clock. Put me on to Roger on the back if you want to. Right then. Let's go and have a word. Good lad. Come on. Let's get you back to the stable. Come on. Come on. What's going on? Let go of that horse. What do you mean? I said let go of What's that going horse. On? I want you back in the van. Listen to me or I'll blow your legs off. What? Go on, move! 
You, bring the nipper. Get in the van. Right, where are the keys to the safe? I don't know. I said, where are the keys to the safe? Honestly, I don't know. If you don't tell me, I'll have to use this. Honestly, I don't know. As far as I know, my dad's got them. We just have to smash it, right? With what? Have you got a sledgehammer? Uh, yes. Where? Just through that door. Ready? It was a good half an hour before the men managed to break the safe. They then removed at least £50,000 worth of gold, jewellery and cash. Rod and Simon were left locked in the van. Sometime around five o'clock, just down the road from Heath House Farm, the lady who'd earlier swerved to avoid a man in a suit saw him again. Oh, look, there's that chap I nearly ran over earlier on. This time, she saw he was with two other men and carrying a case. As she watched, they got into an orange-coloured car, which police believe may have been a larder. Well, it was over an hour and a half before Rod and Simon were released by Gordon Plant when he returned home. The shotgun, brandished by the man in the suit, was loaded, so we have to assume he was prepared to use it. The suit he was wearing was blue with a red pinstripe and his tie had a blue, red and yellow stripe. At the farmhouse he was seen wearing a trilby hat. He's described as about 30, white but with a darkish complexion, medium build and about 5 foot 8 inches tall. The second man was wearing a brown knitted hat and an orange check lumber jacket. He's believed to be about 25, a pale complexion with acne spots. He's about 6 feet tall. Now, among the pieces of jewellery taken was this old silvery, silver sovereign case. It's one like it, anyway. Um, on the one that was stolen, where there was the words inscribed were Birds of Stoke. And also a man's gold ring, like this one, with two buckles on it. This one's very much like the one that was stolen. If you recognise either of these, there's a £5,000 reward for information leading to the recovery of the stolen property and the conviction of the robbers. The victims, incidentally, in our film were played by the actual people. Detective Chief Inspector Tony Brindley is leading the investigation and he and his team are behind me now waiting for your calls, so do please ring if you can help. The number, once again, is 01811 or you can call the Cheadle Police Station in Staffordshire on 0538 755 That's 0538, the code for Cheadle, 755 can I say that if you're trying to ring the incident room in Ballycastle over the Inga Hauser murder, you may have difficulty. Apparently it's been besieged with calls, people trying to help. Do please uh, be patient or call us here in London on 01811 We've uh, had a lot of information on that already, including one man who's fairly sure that he spoke to her in some detail while they were travelling together on a train to Bath. And obviously, if we get more calls on that, we'll let you know. On the Dats and Violet, the hit-and-run car, uh, a number of suggested sightings already. Apparently, uh, one of them is very promising. And Schwinn bikes, you know, those exercise bikes that uh, were in photo, uh, that were in an incident desk that David Hatcher was talking about, apparently they're on uh, sale at the moment, being advertised in the South London press. Again, if we uh, get more on that, we'll let you know. Some more news now from last month's programme. Uh, our Aladdin's Cave of Property, recovered by police, resulted in several happy reunions. Among them was the brass ewer, identified uh, as one stolen from a church in East Brent, a village in Somerset. A woman in Taunton recognised one of the small mantel clocks, and another viewer spotted her own silver teapot. And when those women went to the police station, both of them recognised other items that they'd had stolen. That Aladdin's cave, incidentally, came from a large lorry load of uh, antiques and bric-a-brac, which was packed in a container, together with legitimate exports to the United States, where there's a large market for British artefacts. Now police have firm evidence that, as they'd suspected all along, part of that container load had been stolen. And you might remember in March we showed you of a man robbing a building society in Cheshire. As a result of viewers' calls, a man was sentenced last week at Mould Crown Court to five years' imprisonment. 
And in the same programme, we asked you to help identify a man who was found dead in Holland. The Dutch police approached us for help because the man's clothes were all British made. And following a phone call to the Crime Watch office, the police have now been able to identify him as Alan Smith from Walsall in the West Midlands. Detectives are now making further inquiries about the circumstances of his death. And if you were watching Crime Watch way back in November 1985, you might just recall an armed robbery in North London. The gang used a particularly frightening device. Put your hands on the seat. Come on, spread your legs. Oh, right. oh, right. Do you know what this is? Huh? It's a remote control unit. And it works this. At the touch of a button, it goes off. What you're going to do is take your mate out some tea, get him out of the cab, and if you let him know there's anything wrong, I'll press a button and blow your back out. Understand? The robbery was one of several in which the same gang amassed a small fortune, over one and a quarter million pounds. Well, after our reconstruction, there was a crucial call. A crime watch viewer was convinced that he'd found remains of that strap-on explosive device among some rubbish in a suburb of Hertfordshire. Well, that turned out to be the key that unlocked the whole mystery and helped police to trace and catch the gang. Seven men and one woman have now been sentenced for the crime. And the viewer in that case wanted to remain anonymous, and so his identity has never been revealed. During the trial, he was referred to simply as Witness A. Nonetheless, he'll be receiving a very substantial reward. The story of the police investigation of those robberies will be the subject of the first of three special Crime Watch documentaries, which are to be screened in August. And now to Crime Watch Photo Call, a moving picture book of people wanted by the police or caught on candid camera as they carried out a crime. Here again, Superintendent David Hatcher. First, we need you to help us find this woman. She acquired information about an individual and used it to obtain a passport in the innocent party's name. Then in March, she defrauded banks in London and Gloucester of £19,000. She's in her mid-twenties, five foot seven inches tall and slim. Recognise her? Give us a call. This man, who used the name Roy Marsh, is seen here in a video shop in Redditch. He offered to sell the proprietor £1,300 worth of discount video equipment. When they met to close the deal, Marsh took the money and ran to a waiting car which sped away. Take a closer look at him. He's around 50 years old, about five foot seven inches tall and speaks with a northern accent. He's a very convincing con man and part of a team operating throughout the Midlands. Ring us if you know him. Last year, this man opened 11 bank accounts, some in the name of Smith and some in the name of Johns. He's also signed over 20 credit agreements for televisions, jewellery and clothing. In fact, we think he's netted over £150,000 worth of cash and goods. He also applied for passports in both names and then, early last month, travelled to Dusseldorf in West Germany. While he was there, he cashed 65 euro cheques worth £8,000. He's about 40 years old, 5 foot 11 and maybe travelling with a blonde woman aged around 20. In Kent, we want to trace this man. Posing as a policeman, he held up a post office van which was making cash deliveries in the Whitstable area. He produced a handgun and fired a warning shot. He was joined by a second man and they got away with £82,000. The bogus policeman is described as 5 foot 6 inches tall, 40 and of athletic build. He was bald on top and had a thick, dark moustache. If you recognise him or any of the other photo call faces, ring us now. The number's 01811 8055. That's 01811 8055. Let me keep you up to date with the calls. We've got some names coming in for the man with the triangular scar. And uh, one man at least believes that he may have been offered uh, one of those Schwinn exercise bikes fairly recently. Sue. Well, our next case is another murder investigation, I'm afraid. It's a vicious attack on a woman in Hertfordshire. It was her 81st birthday. Joan McCann was a well-known dog breeder and she'd judged at many shows, including Crufts. What wasn't so well known about her was that she'd been something of a heroine for her remarkable undercover work during the Second World War. Using a false name, Marie Bucquet, she worked in occupied France and she was decorated for helping more than 80 Allied airmen to escape across enemy lines. Later, she settled in Hertfordshire, which is where our reconstruction begins. This is the National Trust's Ashridge estate. And beyond this monument, at the bottom of the lane, is Mrs McCann's cottage, Tim Spring. Her nearest neighbours were her housekeeper, Rita Green, who lives with her son, Dennis. 
It's eight o'clock on Thursday, the fifth of May. Britain is sticking to its policy of not making. There you are. Come along, out of the way. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. There. Lookies. Every breakfast. Morning, Dennis. Morning, Mrs. McCann. Should I take the dogs out now, then? No, I think you'd better leave them a bit longer until I've gone. I'm just off to the hairdressers. Ooh, you might feed the bigger dogs, so. Okay. Morning, Gemma. Morning, Miss McCann. That morning, Joan was at the hairdresser for her regular appointment. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. She'd been coming here every Thursday morning for 12 years. By two o'clock, she was back home to meet her old friend, Margaret Williamson. Yes, it's uh, such a pity, really, to do any inbreeding. It is, really. Margaret was also a dog breeder, and she wanted to talk about using one of Joan's dogs for breeding. Joan was renowned for her Labradors, and people from all over the country came to visit her. So any number of people could have had a good look at her house. Yes, oh dear. By a quarter to seven, Joan was getting ready to go to a meeting of the Kent, Sussex and Surrey Labrador Association. Well, I'm off now, darlings. Be good. She'd been made president 15 months ago. Bye-bye. Rita, her housekeeper, lives a hundred yards up the road. I'm off now, Rita. You won't forget to go down and turn on the lights for me and lock up, will you? No, no, I'll go down later. Goodbye. Bye. The meeting was being held at the Bell Inn at Godston in Surrey. It was a long way from Mrs McCann's home but she always made a special effort to attend the meetings in spite of the 60-mile drive. I'm Reed Council meeting on the 24th of March last. I'm pleased to be able to report to you that all our nominations for inclusion in the judges list have been accepted by the Council. And... I'm terribly sorry to be so late. The traffic was awful on the M25. It Good took me about three you. hours to get here. Yes. Well, Can I sit uh, here? Yes. Yes. At about the same time, Rita was making her way down to the house to look up for the night. Rita knew that Mrs McCann disliked coming back to a dark house, especially as it was so isolated. And she usually put the lights on to make the house look occupied before she locked up. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm now declared the meeting closed. It's 11 o'clock. Don't forget our next meeting here on June the 6th. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good. Mrs McCann's friend, Brian Haywood, remembers she was a little anxious about the long journey home in the dark. You're welcome. Oh, would you follow me? Could I follow you back onto the M25, yes. please? Yes, that's, that's you fine. You know how tied yeah. up I get yeah, that's in that right. one-way system. Yes, that's good. No problem. Well, I'll see you in a month, then. Look forward to that, then, Joan. Goodbye, Brian. Bye-bye. As she followed him out of the car park, Brian, of course, couldn't have known that he would be the last person to see her alive. A courting couple are crucial witnesses for what happened next. This is the lane leading to Mrs McCann's cottage. I what he wants. The couple noticed a car drive up and down six or seven times. They didn't see what make of car it was, but they remember it was a four-door saloon.
Later, the same couple saw an estate car drive down the track. That must have been Mrs. McCann arriving home. Mrs. McCann died before she even got into the house. Well, Richard Pottinger is in charge of the investigation. Why do you think she was killed? Very difficult to say. We know it's a very savage, senseless killing of a defenceless lady. The burglar had no reason to kill her whatsoever. He could have escaped from that house into the woods with no problems at all. Well, there were several suspicious cars seen in the lane by that couple. Uh, half an hour after the time she would have arrived home, the couple saw an estate car, rather like her own car, coming back down the lane. Could yeah. that have been her car? No, it was not her car uh, at all. We believe that it was a Bluebird estate car leaving about half past one. We still not have eliminated that vehicle, so we asked if that was owned by a courting couple for them to come forward. Right. And what about that saloon car then, the one that was seen going up and down several times? The saloon, court, saloon car, all we know is it's a four-door, dark-coloured saloon. We haven't traced those occupants, so we asked them to come forward as well. And we don't know the make or the colour of that for Not sure? Not at all. No. The stolen property, it seems to me, is going to be the key to solving this murder. That is correct. And there were three very distinctive bronze statues among the goods stolen. We'll start with that one. This is a copy of one of the ones that's stolen. Made it, this is cast iron. The one that was stolen was bronze. Yes, it's a bronze antique uh, pointer dog uh, with a, a rabbit. Uh, signed on the side with PJ Menet, uh, valued about £2,500. This is a greyhound on the one stolen, solid brass, but on a small, uh, solid bronze on a smaller base with E from A on the base signed there. Right. The third one is so rare we can't get a copy of it, but we do have an artist's impression of what it looked like. Yes, Tell that, us about that. That is extremely rare. It's of a pointed dog with a rabbit on the base. The, the, it has become detached from the base, the one that has been stolen. Well, those are very distinctive. What else was stolen? A number of items were stolen, including a number of small uh, snuff boxes, which are quite uh, unusual, and a number of small ornaments. Right. So what is the most important part of your appeal tonight? My most important appeal is to all antique dealers, second-hand dealers. Should any of this property be offered to them, please contact us. But in the main, I'm asking members of the public, no doubt those who are watching tonight, there must be somebody out there who, who knows who's responsible for this particular vicious murder, either mother, father, friends, or whatever, I urgently ask them to come forward and contact us. All right, Mr. Potter, thank you very much indeed. You. And if you recognise or you think you know about either of those cars or you know the whereabouts of those bronze dog statues, this is the number to phone. It's 01 811 8055. Or you can phone the murder incident room direct on 0707 33 That's 0707, the code for Welling Garden City, 33 we seem to have uh, positive information about those York, uh, vase, Yorkshire vases. Uh, almost certainly they've been identified by the owner and independently by the people as having uh, come from Southampton. Uh, the Gloucestershire con woman, uh, we've got a positive name and address which police are now investigating. On the Stoke robberies, uh, a caller has seen a yellow larder of the type that was described. It's been uh, abandoned at the end of a lane for the last two weeks. Police are now checking that out. On the Dorset uh, hit and run, more suggestions uh, and sightings. And in particular, one man uh, thinks he knows which car was involved, a Datsun that's been resprayed locally. Well, as always, you can write to us if you have more information at Crime Watch UK, BBC TV, London, W12, 8QT. We'll repeat the phone numbers on Crime Watch Update. That's uh, in an hour from now at 11.10. They're also on CFAX on page 186 for the next few days. 
Well, we're about to take a summer break now, so there'll be no Crime Watch in July or in August, but there will be a series of three documentaries, as I mentioned earlier, and they'll be retracing cases that Crime Watch viewers have been involved in. The series is called Crime Watch File, and it starts on Wednesday, August the 10th. Meanwhile, don't forget that our uh, number here is open until midnight, 01811 and Crime Watch will be back in the autumn on September the 8th. Until then, watch out, watch out for other people and have a carefree, crime-free summer. Whatever happens, don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night.